And joining us now on the debate, in Miami, Florida, Gypsy Metalus, Executive Director of Safla, the um, Saint, La excuse me, Executive Director at the Haitian Neighborhood Center. Thank you. In Washington, D.C., Todd Moss, Senior Fellow at the Center for Global Development. And here in studio, Elizabeth Abbott, author of Haiti, The Devaliers and Their Legacy, and Janice Stein, TVO's own foreign affairs analyst. And this is a Your Agenda Thursday broadcast where you are part of the discussion. You can reach us via Twitter at twitter.com slash the agenda or by email at the agenda at tvo.org. Also, as always, our fifth column blogger, Mike Miner, is hosting an online chat on our Inside Agenda Producers blog. That's at tvo.org slash the agenda. So please dial us up, <coughs> jump in, and join the debate. Okay, Gypsy, first of all, my apologies for screwing up your introduction. It really does get a lot better from here on in. But let's, um, let me start, if I actually can, with uh, Todd in Washington, because uh, leading business people and policymakers uh, met, of course, in Davos, Switzerland last week, and they focused primarily on rebuilding Haiti. Can you remind us what came out of that meeting? Well, I think the, the, the challenge for the international community in Haiti is making that transition from the immediate emergency period where you're trying to save lives, you're dealing with logistical issues of trying to get water uh, and food in to help save people in the, in the very short term. And it's really trying to think about, well, what do we do uh, in, the, in the coming weeks in transitioning and trying to actually rebuild the country? And importantly for Haiti, this is unlike at the end of World War II, uh, I think we'd all be quite disappointed if in several years' time we've just gotten Haiti back to where it was uh, a month ago. I think uh, Haiti was such a poor place uh, that was uh, a difficult place to live uh, that we want to actually try to make sure that we're, uh, we're making Haiti uh, a more prosperous uh, and stable place for the long-term future. And that's just a really, really difficult challenge. Janice, has anyone in a position to know actually ventured an estimate of how, of how much it is going to cost to rebuild this country? No, there's no number or dollar amount that we can really attach to this. All we've had, Steve, so far is estimates of the time that it will take. And the, the sober-minded people are talking about a decade or more. And I think that's a very important message uh, to everyone who has given. Uh, that this is a long-term commitment. One of the things we suffer from is attention deficit disorder uh, when it comes to these kinds of problems. So it is a long-term commitment and you need staying power. Gypsy, what are you hearing about in the terms of how long this will take to do and how much it will cost and where all the money is going to come from? I totally agree with the comments made so far. Clearly this is 10, 15, 20 years even. This is a long-term commitment, as, as has been stated. And of course, in terms of the amounts, we, uh, at this point, you know, we've heard numbers thrown about. I know that overall, we know it's gonna take more than a billion dollars. And, 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 and even saying a billion dollars, uh, I can't wrap my head around what that actually means, practically and concretely, because we just don't know. We just don't know. We know that it will involve a lot of money and a long-term effort. Well, one of the things, Elizabeth, we keep hearing about is just as there was a quote-unquote Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe after the end of World War II, Haiti needs its own Marshall Plan right now. Uh, specifically, what needs doing? Well, first of all, I think that uh, Port-au-Prince itself has to be rethought. Uh, it's always been a joke that uh, Port-au-Prince is the Republic of Port-au-Prince as opposed to the Republic of Haiti. It's, it's too centralized, it's too overbuilt and so on. And the earthquake has um, highlighted the, pro the, the structural and infrastructural problems of Port-au-Prince. And so a there, there are many uh, vital or, or formerly vital uh, city centers in, in Haiti. If you just go all around it, there was Jacmel, there was Jérémy, there's Cap Haïtien, uh, Saint-Marc and, and Gonaïve and so on. And they should now be, you know, they should, this should be an opportunity to rethink uh, the centralization and, uh, the, and things like the engine, there's an engineering... Um, Can I just stop there for a second? Yes. Just tell me, uh, it's interesting, you didn't say yeah. rebuild Port-au-Prince, you said rethink Port-au-Prince. That's right. So that means it, it get, decentralize the city. Everything can't be there. Is that I, the I idea? mean decentralize That's Haiti. Ha Haiti has become too focused on Port-au-Prince. I see. And it's uh, to the detriment of other vital city centers that were, that were really at one point quite wonderful. Uh, Port-au-Prince clearly cannot have three million people in it or even two million people in it again. Can't stand that many. It, it can't take that many. The Gypsy, can I get you there. on that? What, what do you think needs to be done? 
Uh, absolutely. I think this is an opportunity to have uh, diverse and all voices throughout Haitian society, as well as the Haitian diaspora involved in rethinking uh, Port-au-Prince, as, as, as was stated. Clearly, there's been ta talk and conversations around an administrative capital located somewhere in the vicinity of Port-au-Prince, but clearly the goal would be to decentralize, to ensure that local government entities are duly and properly empowered, such that uh, this, 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 this every, the Republic of Port-au-Prince phenomenon does not get replicated, because clearly that's not worked, that's not been practical, that's caused a lot of problems, and we're certainly experiencing and living some of those problems right now. And so uh, the voices that have been for the past 20 years or so calling for this administrative capital as a step to begin the decentralization process, mm -hmm. I think that now uh, uh, that message is going to get a lot of traction, a Jen lot of traction. And Jen clearly, oh. you know, with that, there must be the participation, and I'll, and I'll reiterate it, the participation of Haitians across the, the Haitian society in Haiti, as well as Haitians throughout the, the Haitian diaspora. Okay, and hold I, that thought I, for I, a I second, that Gypsy. That has to be very, very important. Hold that thought, because we are going to come back to that angle in it. Janice, I know you're very big, obviously, on, on institutions and building institutions. The institutions of this country are completely broken. Where do you even start to rebuild? You know, Gypsy put her finger on a really important issue in answer to your question. And let me pose it as a tension, uh, which we don't want to talk about because uh, it offends uh, some sensibilities, both in the aid community oh. and in Haiti. Gypsy's right that if you don't involve the Haitians on the ground and you don't involve the Haitian diaspora, and there isn't a Haitian leadership that takes ownership of this, nothing will work. But on the other hand, there's a deficit of expertise. There's a deficit of engineering expertise. There's a deficit of medical and health expertise. So how, in fact, you have this conversation about how much outsiders have a, to say and how much Haitians can be in the lead is a really, really delicate dance with, frankly, no easy answer. And we're seeing the tensions already developing around this issue. Well, let me get Todd to follow up on that. Do you think it's necessary for those who are in positions of leadership in the richer countries to simply have a very frank conversation with those who are in leadership positions in Haiti and saying, look, we know you need to be in charge of your own rebuilding uh, if this is going to work, but you're in no position to do it right now, so we're going to take the lead. Can you have that conversation? Well, look, th this is a challenge that, uh, that the international community faces in post-conflict situations, in uh, natural disasters where you've got very weak governments, they're facing a crisis. You know that if you just come in and from the outside and just try to do what you think is right, you're inevitably going to get it wrong uh, and you'll inevitably come up against uh, the, the local um, the local authorities who, who may have other ideas about what the country's priorities are uh, and where resources should be allocated and really what's the best way forward. Uh, but the, the dilemma that you have is when you, when, uh, you have to start that dialogue early, uh, really try to get uh, the Haitians uh, at the table early, um, but also at the same time, there, there's inevitably, because of the situation, you're going to have to, uh, to drive things as well from the outside. So it's trying to get that balance right and over time shift uh, to where there can be more and more Haitian uh, responsibility and ownership over time. But clearly that can't be too do done too quickly. You know, no, just, I a get quick the, one, just a quick one on this one. There are already are planning meetings in the transition from what we call relief to development. The Haitian voice in those planning meetings very limited. Well, uh, I would think so. I mean, many, many of the leading, presumably, political leaders, uh, engineering leaders, civil servants, are dead, aren't That's they? That's exactly right. Yeah. The institutions are not really working as we know. Uh, even Haitians are complaining about the fact that their government is absent, not present, not reassuring, not able to reach out. But in the international meetings that are going on, Steve, it's very hard to find a leading Haitian voice right now, and yet the plans for the long term are being made as we speak. Hmm. So, Gypsy, give us uh, some more idea. We've heard about decentralizing port au prince We've talked about trying to rebuild institutions. We've tried about trying to collect some, um, you know, some IOUs from around the world so that the, the world can help build. We've talked about the essence of getting uh, Haitians in leadership positions involved in this. What are some of the other priorities we got to keep our eye on tonight? Well, I think that we have to agree on a set of fundamental principles. And those principles have to include, one, 
the voices of Haitians, and, I, and I'll keep saying that because while it's true that in Haiti there is that leadership vacuum, while it's true that the existing leaders have been impacted as human beings by this tragedy, we recognize that and we understand that. Uh, we understand that the Haitian government uh, and its weakness, you know, is limited in resources. We understand those issues, but that doesn't that doesn't suggest that there are no competent voices in Haiti able to sit at the table where decisions are being made that are going to impact an entire population. I think we've done this over and over again, and we clearly know that that doesn't work. And so, for me, a fundamental principle would be that those uh, Haitian voices be at the table, whether they're the expert voices or the voices of the people who are going to live and work and make that new Haitian society work. And so the new vision, the, the vision for New Haiti has to be uh, uh, a process that, 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 that takes place sort of organically, if you will, to include and incorporate all of those voices. For me, I think, and for most Haitian Americans, if not all, that is fundamental. And two, I think that we have to approach this recognizing that the second principle is around recognizing the sovereignty of the Haitian state, recognizing okay. that in all of its weaknesses and all of its challenges, it is still a nation. Understood. I want to, Gypsy, forgive me, I want to jump in there for a sec. Has to be part. I want to jump yes. in for a sec because uh, I want to introduce your colleague who has just joined us, okay. and that is Chantal Verna. Hi. We welcome her back to the program. She's Assistant Professor Thank of History you. and Thanks International so Relations at Florida International University. Chantal, I understand you were having a little um, negotiating your way through a bit of Super Bowl traffic down there, so uh, we're glad you could make it traffic into the studio. Traffic construction, classic Miami. Exactly. And back onto our program. And let me just put you to work right away. I want to read you something that was in the Wall Street Journal uh, just today. Uh, here's the quote. In our haste to help Haiti, we need to resist the kind of sloppy thinking that can lead to false assumptions and overly optimistic plans. The recent call by International Monetary Fund Managing Director Dominique Strauss-Kahn for a quote-unquote Marshall Plan for Haiti, which is now being echoed by many others, is a case in point. Such a plan, even if it was embraced by developed countries, has little chance of succeeding. The Marshall Plan succeeded in helping to usher in the European economic miracle of the 1950s, but it did so, according to most historians, because the bulk of aid went to developed nations that merely needed an economic jumpstart. Before the quake, there were more than 10,000 non-governmental organizations in Haiti feeding the poor, providing health services, and much more. This fact alone should give the world pause. Haiti doesn't need to be rebuilt. It needs to be built. Uh, okay, Chantal, come on in on that. What do you think about that quote from the Wall Street Journal? Well, I agree for the most part. Um, <laughs> and, and my pause is, is just with the final part in terms of thinking about Haiti needs to be built. Uh, I think we, we all often operate with the assumption that we're starting from completely ground zero in Haiti. And that's um, incorrect. I've been glad to hear uh, a few comments uh, as I came in uh, talking about recognizing what already exists in Haiti, who already is operating in Haiti. And many of those are, are Haitian institutions as well as some of the NGOs. And I think it's very interesting for us to remember that uh, what I've heard is that after India, uh, Haiti has been second in the world in terms of per capita. Uh, dollars going towards NGOs, and that's that's very striking. So uh, attention and money directed towards Haiti has not been what we've lacked. Um, it has been, uh, again, much of what has already been said, attention to voices across the board. And there's a lot of discussion thus far about uh, the failures of the existing government, and I think that's an overly broad statement. I think what we see most publicly is that um, the, those vacuums, but, but there are people within the bureaucracy who, who are very dedicated and very diligent, and they work with members of civil society, they work with members of the NGO, and so we need to find ways to bring light to those institutions and to those individuals and to draw out the best that already exists in Haiti mm -hmm. and to partner that with uh, our, 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 our friends is the language that many people are using from abroad and as well as members of the diaspora from abroad. Okay, Janice and then no, Elizabeth on this one. Let me put the cat among the pigeons here mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 <laughs> and put forward a proposition that actually the highest priority uh, for Haiti uh, has to be to create some economic opportunity. I'm really struck by the resourcefulness of the Haitian population mm -hmm. as it's self-organized in the wake of this. Uh, the, you know, the performance by the international <laughs> aid community has been slow. 
The UN took two weeks to get its top logistical people in. It has not been a bravura performance, frankly. So what do you see on the ground? A real capacity among Haitians to organize themselves in communities, to plan distribution, to make the best use of scarce resources. What do they lack? They lack infrastructure. When they, when agri, you know, agricultural produce that Haitians grow can't get to market. Uh, so that one of the priorities absolutely has to be to lay down with Haitians doing the work, not to bring in outside contractors, but to lay down mm -hmm. the basic infrastructure which Haiti desperately needs so that its economy can grow and create some jobs. Elizabeth? I'd also, I'd like to t uh, talk about two things. One, uh, Chantal mentioned, and that is, the, we talk about the vacuum of government in Haiti as if it's a, a, an absolute fact. And I really think that uh, how is the Haitian government uh, supposed to get get around and and is it supposed does it, it would it have to go around with bullhorns and so on? It's the Haitian right, government is in a tent right now. It is in a right. tent and and it it is you know so I, I really take exception to the dismissal of the Haitian government as some losing thing. I think that they are taking any, any time they can. They uh, the ministers and so on and even and even the president are taking. Um, taking good positions and, and sensible and responsible positions on matters and wanting to take control and so on. They understand it as well as just the actual mechanics of doing it. I mean, I would say here's 50, 000, 50 bullhorns, you know, and, and, and go and, and go to all the, the different sites because people, how are they going to know what the government is doing? They don't have TV. Uh, there have been, been some radios given out, but that's all. Uh, you, you know, it's cell not. Phones. Cell phones. Cell phones, yeah. Okay, cell phones, cell phones will all, well, still, there need, there need to be bullhorns, there needs to be something. Second, um, the, 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 uh, the, there is a huge Haitian diaspora that has much of the, uh, I know so many Haitians here who are so talented in so many ways. There are engineers, there are, you know, there are judges, there are teachers and business people and I, IT people and you name it, they're, they're, they are here. And they have to, there is not a lack of, of Haitian expertise. There's always been, there's in any uh, country uh, there, with, with a, a, a huge um, diaspora, there's always tension between the diaspora and the mother country. When you go and you say, well, I think this is what you do, and they sort of look at you and say, well, who are you? You know, you, don't you left. You don't live here, yeah, you exactly. left, and you know. Uh, but now I think that, that this, this has pretty well erased that that and and the diaspora is is now recognized first of all it provides and always has so much money to Haiti i think i believe that the re remittances are the first or the second source of income yes. so that's really important and second the expertise is now i don't think it, there's a question anymore that that Haitians in Haiti are going to resent having a Haitian engineer a Haitian whatever as opposed to a foreign one uh, and, and so I think that now is a time for that, for the, for the diaspora to take its rightful role in Haiti. Okay, right G after... Hang on, I gotta hear from Gypsy now. Gypsy, you come by. I saw you furiously scribbling some notes there, so what did you want to comment on? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to address two points. The, sure. On the communication side, I think it's true that the Haitian government has not done all that it should have uh, in terms of addressing the international community. And I say that understanding clearly that it's very challenging. But on, on the upside, I know that they've done a tremendous job in addressing the local population via radio. And this is what I'm hearing from my friends and my colleagues who work in Haiti. And so there, they're very resentful uh, of the fact that that is the world perception and it is what it is. We're, we're not seeing uh, you know, the Haitian government regularly on CNN saying what it's doing, talking about its challenges. And that, that's true, but we don't mm -hmm. want to dismiss what they have done. So that, that's one. And the second point on the diaspora, I, I don't want us to continue to put forth our relationship, our money relationship with Haiti, because I don't think that that serves us as a diaspora, and it doesn't serve uh, the degree to which the, the, the Haitians in Haiti are willing to accept this expertise, willing to accept this input, because then they'll see that we're just another, another group of providers of aid who dictate the terms and the conditions under which the aid will be applied. And so, yes, there's expertise. Yes, there's willingness to contribute in, in, in the rebuilding process. But there is also the need for us as a diaspora to really step up and utilize this opportunity and make it our defining moment. This has to be the opportunity where our relationship with Haiti goes beyond remittances 
and, 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 and moves towards um, supporting more projects, being more philanthropic, and doing the kinds of things that we know are necessary, have been called for by the Haitian population. Okay, well, and let me put this uncomfortable issue on the table then, if I can. Todd, I'm going to get Please. you to comment on this. Uh, you know, we've been getting tweets and emails throughout the course of the evening here, and I saw one just come across the screen a moment ago, which said, you know, if we do give money, is it really going to good, or are we just subsidizing the local kleptocracy all over again? Now, that thought is out there. Can you speak to that? Shut well, myself. Think, no, know, that's Todd. Todd the, in Washington. The, uh, uh, the, the question, I think, is hinting at, uh, at, at one of the problems that, that helped to make Haiti so... Uh, not only poor, but so vulnerable to natural disasters and earthquakes uh, and, and really just a, a, a total lack of, uh, of an ability to deal with, with these crises relative to, to some of its neighbors. Um, and that's because uh, uh, there, there's a very small number of elite families that have controlled uh, the economy of Haiti and the politics of Haiti uh, for so long that that the the dysfunction has really set in. I think what one of the one of the opportunities from a from a horrific tragedy like this is to really try to remake not just to rebuild uh, buildings that fell down, but to actually try to remake uh, some of the power systems in Haiti, uh, such as land ownership, um, that could really provide the basis for a long-term recovery so that Haiti can be a more prosperous place. Uh, I think we've seen in East Asia in particular that certain uh, crises led to changes in land ownership that really s set the foundation for a future economic success. Uh, and I think that Haiti is in that window right now. Okay, let me get Chantel and then Elizabeth on this as well. No, I absolutely agree. I mean, one of the main things that I've been stressing is that it, it, it's about social and political relations uh, more than the construction. Again, we've had do many dollars already going towards programs, towards the paving of roads, towards the building of, of, of institutions. I um, mean, it's really about what we do with those institutions as we move forward. Elizabeth and then Janice. Yeah, I'd like to say something about aid and something about we, we, we put all the blame on the kleptocracy in, in Haiti. Uh, right mm. now, the a Swiss court has just said that uh, Jean-Claude Duvalier is allowed to have the money, the millions of dollars, I believe it's 4.6 with interest 5.7, uh, that he stole from Haiti, and he's allowed to have that. Now, but if they froze it, the money. But, it, but, but the, the, to me, what's in, what the point of that is that it is donor countries that allowed all that money, and that's the tip of the iceberg, to be, to be in his personal coffers. We were not, we did not expect, expect any, uh, you know, exercise any accountability. And now we are saying, oh, we have to forgive Haiti's debt. We gave, we, we donated money, did not, ex, you know, exerted no accountability. It was stolen, we knew it was being stolen. And, and, and now we're saying, well, you know, we give them all this money and nothing happens. Well, but who are we giving the money to? Okay, fair point. You know, Jeff? just on Elizabeth's points, because uh, you, Elizabeth, great lead in. Because uh, what you're really asking, Steve, is what's the accountability for money that donors give? And that's a charged question. You only asked, is it going to be stolen by local elites? But if that's a small problem, relatively speaking, mm -hmm. what's the accountability for the way the aid organizations actually spend the money? Mm -hmm. How much do we know? You must have given to the to the, um, the combined appeal. Are you asking, where's my money going? Tell me about the results nine months from now. Where's the report back on how that money was spent? So where's the accountability from the NGOs themselves? Where's the accountability from the NGOs themselves? We turn almost instinctively to the kleptocracy argument. But that's, a, that's one part, but certainly, you, you, as Elizabeth said. You're not said. going to compare the Duvaliers to what uh, Mensa Sans Frontières no, are doing down there. No, I'm not. I'm not. But I, I, I'm saying, if you actually look at Haiti today, the likelihood of AIDS of funds being misused by the government is a part of the picture, but there's a bigger issue of accountability of how all the aid dollars that we give to non-governmental organizations that are, by the way, northern, if you actually look, northern headquartered, how do they spend it? What's the value okay, for money? fair point. And I we don't know the answer to that. Right. Uh, Michael Smith, our director, let's do these back-to-back -back graphics right now. We've got USA Today and then the New York Times. We'll start with USA Today. After receiving $8.3 billion in foreign aid since 1969, Haiti is 25% poorer than it was in 1945. 
That according to statistics compiled by Nick Eberstadt, an economist with the American Enterprise Institute. Even before the January 12th earthquake that killed at least 100,000 people, there, uh, three quarters of Haiti's nine million people lived on less than two dollars a day, the UN says. To which the New York Times' David Brooks writes the following. We don't know how to use aid to reduce poverty. Over the past few decades, the world has spent trillions of dollars to generate growth in the developing world, and the countries that have not received much aid, like China, have seen tremendous growth and tremendous poverty reductions. The countries that have received aid, like Haiti, have not. Okay, let's get into this. Uh, Gypsy, start us off here. Decades of aid in Haiti hasn't worked. Will donors learn well, a new lesson this time? Well, I, in my mind, there are two separate issues here. On the one hand, there is, I think, the confusion, the generalized confusion around whether or not the aid goes to an NGO or to uh, another non-governmental entity versus the Haitian government itself. We hear this criticism pretty often that, you know, the government's corrupt, that, they, you know, they're going to take this money and they're going to misuse it. Uh, but in, in the mind of the average donor, there's not that clear distinction between when it's the Haitian government that receives the aid and when it's other organizations that do. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, utilization of aid uh, to, uh, to, you know, with the result of just general impoverish, uh, impoverishment, if that's a word, of the population, uh, we understand, uh, you know, there, there's that, 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 that trap, you know. We know that the more people, the more the countries borrow under the wrong conditions, under conditions that are imposed very often by our own, our very own USAID and other institutions that, that, that purport to to want to see development, um, the way in which they, they, they impose certain rules and certain <laughs> regulations only serve to result in increased poverty and, and no development. Okay, and I want so to get a follow-up from Chantal that we've got on the to same put. issue. Go ahead, Chantal. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think we also have to think about context when we're making comparisons. Um, you know, understanding the context within which funds are being distributed and, and how they're being used. Uh, I, I appreciate the focus on the idea of accountability on both ends. Uh, oftentimes this, the criticism is only on the, on the receiving end and we need to think about the fact that the people who are trying to help are also trying and there needs to be a t attention to the fact that, that we as a, as a world are trying to learn how to address this issue of poverty uh, and, and, and related, related matters. So, the failure, the quote unquote failures, can not only be seen on the side of, of the country that's receiving the aid, um, and, and, and I personally like to stay away from the language of failure, but to, to, to identify the fact that overall we are all trying to understand you know, what works. Good what can from Janice, and you know what? Go David Brooks is right. We do not know what, how to reduce poverty. We've been struggling for 50 years, and the truth of the matter is, inside the universities and, mm -hmm. and the social science community and the aid professionals, we do not know. We only know one thing, Steve. We know there is no magic bullet. We know there's no single program. We've gone through periods over the last 30 years of what I would call fads, okay? One is empower women. If you just empower women, we're going we're gonna to reduce poverty. Build infrastructure, if you just build infrastructure. Invest in education, send girls to school. I mean, we've had a series of these quick bullets that we hope will do magically reduce poverty. None of them alone will work. It's a very complex, hard problem. And I think that we need to understand that we don't know. And once we know we don't know, we're a lot more humble. So get out of the way? Is that the no, better idea? No, not get out of the way because Haitians don't have, they are among the poorest in the world, they do not have adequate resources. But be careful where you walk is the way I would put it, right? Take a step, but only when, you can, when Haitians are with you. And if they're not, stop. Uh, and understand again that this is a long, complex process. Mm. Put in place some measures <clears throat> so that if you're misstepping along the way, you're getting some feedback and you're saying this isn't working. Let me get some feedback from Todd, then we'll go to Mike Miner. Yeah, I, I think there's an important distinction here. Not all aid is the same. Aid uh, to, uh, to help uh, deal with a humanitarian crisis uh, <laughs> tends to be relatively effective if, yeah. uh, if we're well organized aid for a very specific purpose, like trying to deliver uh, antiretrovirals to, to, to treat p people with uh, suffering from HIV AIDS, 
uh, to get rid of river blindness. We're actually very good at specific targeted uh, interventions. What we have not been good at is, is precisely what uh, the, the previous speaker uh, mentioned is we don't know how to generate uh, economic growth. Uh, we've had a lot of ideas out there and a lot of failures. And I think failure is not too strong a word when we've got so many countries. Uh, I work mostly on sub-Saharan Africa. and We've got about two dozen countries that have been receiving aid for many decades and are still poorer than they were in 1970. That is absolutely failure. Now, I think um, one of the things that, that seems to point um, toward why that happens is that when you have dysfunctional politics and uh, social uh, dynamics in a country, aid can tend to reinforce those dynamics. Uh, I haven't been to Haiti for, for many years, but Haiti has many of those characteristics of a society where uh, elites uh, had a very tight grip on power, the average person had no chance to open a business, to try and grow a business, to have that economic opportunity that we all see as uh, the ladder to hopefully to middle class, um, and uh, and that the aid system in some ways helped reinforce that, uh, that that those restrictions. Okay. Well, we are having this conversation on television. I should tell you that our Mike Miner has been moderating an online chat. If you go to our homepage, tvo.org/theagenda, you can sign up and participate in that, or just see what everybody else is up to. Mike, come on in and tell us what's going on. Well, Steve, there's a lot of discussion about how we know what the efforts that are going on here in Canada, what are the results that they're getting over there. Uh, Marcin from Toronto says he's become far too skeptical of many charities simply by the amounts that often get consumed in administrative costs and other things. That's you know, not where he wants his money to go. August and Victor are discussing whether the Haitian government can be trusted in this scenario. And we have George, who is a Haitian. He was a civil engineer working in Port-au-Prince. And he says that Haiti needs a Marshall Plan. He says the international community has to take the lead on this because he thinks the Haitian government just cannot be trusted uh, to handle this situation. And Salim <coughs> Khan, who's a regular on our chats, had this to say. I'd like to read this. I know someone who refuses to participate in or donate to any emergency relief efforts. His contention is that this kind of relief is typically overfunded, financial controls are invariably lax, and the long-term sustainable aid that lifts people out of poverty remains woefully underfunded. He wants to know what people think of this. And the general theme of the conversation that's going on down here is that we know what's going on in Canada. There's a big push to give money there. And then it goes into a kind of mystery state. And people are left looking at the television, trying to find out where their efforts have gone. And in the age of internet transparency, they find that really lacking. OK, well, Mike, maybe uh, get on your keyboard and ask him, what would he have us do instead? And uh, if you hear something, you'll let us know at the end of the program. In the meantime, I want to get into something here on the psychology of aid, and I want to read th this somewhat provocative graphic. Let's not kid ourselves, the author says. Donating to charity really isn't that noble. By no means do I want to discourage people from donating or minimize the impact these donations may have, but let's at least face reality and admit that giving to charity is a piecemeal solution. It's a half-assed attempt to assuage our collective guilt and a tacit acknowledgement that we are not prepared to do anything substantial to help. Before people start tooting their own horns for how much money has been raised for Haiti, it's worth mentioning that had people not ignored the plight, of the Haitian people until it was plastered all over television, Facebook, Twitter, and every other major media outlet, a relief effort of this scale would not be necessary. Okay, Gypsy, re react to that quote, if you would. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to disagree with, um, with a lot of what I've heard, uh, but I, I do recognize that people give, people want to give in spite of. People give for various reasons, that's true. Uh, some people uh, do so because it's the easiest thing to do. Uh, some people do so because it advances their own philanthropic uh, uh, endeavors. Uh, and other people give uh, for the wrong reasons. That, that, that's clear, too. And so, um, uh, it, 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 I don't know, Chantal, pick up on that because <laughs> that, that... Okay, Chantal, <laughs> let me hear Chantal, then Elizabeth, and Janice. <laughs> Sure. Well, I, I agree with, with what Gypsy said. It's a, it's a mixed bag, and we have to pay attention to that. But one thing that I could say, I, while I really agree that, that what we have neglected to do in the past is, is, is we're forced to face with it at this moment, uh, that's why I've been excited about this moment as an opportunity for us to move forward. And so what you also have in terms of this moment is the opportunity for new donors and people who are now 
uh, newly conscious about Haiti and aware about Haiti. It's been very interesting for me as a, as a history professor to be receiving messages and people reaching out to me, not only to think about how they can, where they can give their, their money, but also where they can learn more about Haiti. So this is also an opportunity for people to really become invested in multiple ways in, in Haiti's future. And, and as I like to say, in our, in, our, in our world's future, because the issues that Haiti deals with are issues that we deal with in our respective societies. Elizabeth? Yeah, I think that it's a, a bit self-indulgent of us to be wondering if we're giving because we're guilty and so on and so forth. I really think that's pretty, pretty uh, futile and, 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 and cynical and, and irrelevant. Um, you know, why, for example, did the Eastern Township school bus drivers raise $5,000 matchable by the government because they felt guilty? I mean, you know, people are... We're not saying they felt guilty. People, We're wondering what the motive was. Well, it wasn't guilt, whatever it was. How they, do they know? So, I do know. They just looked at these images on television of suffering people, of, of an incredible scenario that they... And it's there but for the grace of God. And and they can give and they give. And also, what, is, what this whole debate is doing, not just here on the agenda, but, but in, the, in the press and, and, as you say, in Facebook and Twitter and everywhere else, is that it's making people question uh, the, where aid money goes and, and where specific, you know, the transparency issue. And where, for example, I read a report by Associated Press the other day that with some USAID, uh, USAID, 33% uh, of, of aid um, goes to the military. Now, I would I would challenge the uh, the comment that we're good at giving delivering um, immediate aid and relief. We're not. If we were, we would not have waited two to three weeks before we even began to feed everybody. And I don't even believe everybody's fed now. Well, of course, so the, we're the not. The military was there well before that. Do you, do you the, think the they should be entitled to some of that money? I think that the military was, I think that the cost of, mil of uh, for the military was misused. I think that there was way too much stress on security that wasn't needed, as, as Janice said. Uh, the Haitian people is, is very capable uh, of, of self you know, of, of self-discipline and so on, and it, and there were there have been many instances of aid being being distributed by people who come and say, find a com community leaders and say, how do you think we should do this, and letting them handle it, and it's done instead of a whole lot of you know really in, in huge numbers of of American soldiers at airports right. being scared of okay. you know because someone um, stole a water bottle begging Elizabeth's forgiveness here I do want to pursue the the, <laughs> the psychological reason why people so, give the pictures are on TV people see them we actually did they research. give and why so we did research a group of a group of academic colleagues um, did a, a series of interviews in different countries on why people give, uh, what are they reacting to? And at one level, we know some answers. It's not guilt, uh, Elizabeth. She's right, right about that. I'm right. It's, <laughs> not, it's not guilt. Uh, what it is, uh, is there is an imperative that they feel to do something. They don't know what, quite what to do. They're upset when they see these pictures. They're horrific pictures. Anybody who's watched Haiti over the last two weeks, you know, from little kids to, are horrified by what they see. And so there's this imperative to act. And where does that come from? It's actually quite interesting. It's an emotional reaction. It's not a rational, thought out action. But we're hardwired, believe it or not, to be helpful to others who are suffering. It's in our DNA um, because it was very functional from an evolutionary perspective. If you lived in a community and you helped somebody who was suffering, the expectation was, well, they would help you when you were suffering. Well, today, I can't get on a plane and go to Haiti And they don't to want do you something. to anyway. And they don't need me there. I'm useless. I'm an academic, you know, absolutely impractical. So what do I do instead? I give to an NGO. And so we call these organizations, interesting, it came out of the research, we call these um, organizations virtue organizations because they're our proxy. We can't do it ourselves, so we give to them in this emotional, impulsive giving. Do you know what? I, I think we, we had somebody either just email or tweet a moment ago, and they put it up on the screen, and, and the comment was, this is the one small, pathetic thing that I can that's do. Right. That's right. He's got this. The, the, your viewer has it exactly right. See, that's what our research found. Okay, but let me try this out with, um, uh, with Todd. <laughs> is there an element of paternalism at play, too, insofar as... You know, we in the rich West know best, and so that's why we're getting involved. Well, look, I think, you know, when we're, we've talked a lot here about, you know, about regular people 
uh, you know, giving ten dollars uh, for a charity when they see a crisis on TV. And we've seen that, you know, really starting in the in the eighties with the Ethiopian famine. Uh, so that that's a phenomenon that we have this cycle. But if we look at the aid, the international aid system, it's actually dominated by governments, uh, by the Canadian government, by U the U.S. government, some of the European governments that that have large scale aid programs. And for the most part, those are given <coughs> for a range of security and economic r reasons. Uh, we, we give because we're trying to build either allies or security partners or we're trying to create markets. Um, but it's also true that for the governments, there's a very, very strong humanitarian impulse. Now, why, why would, uh, for example, the American government have a humanitarian impulse? Well, that's because that's what the, 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 the population through, especially through Congress, demands. Uh, the U.S. interest in fighting HIV AIDS in places like Haiti uh, and, and in Africa uh, is really not a major strategic interest, uh, but it's something that the, the population uh, through the churches, through different interest groups have, 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 uh, have told our leaders that, look, we can fix this problem and we want you to do that. And I think that's similar to what's going on when you have uh, a natural disaster. The U.S. government has tremendous capacity. It might not be as fast as everybody would like, uh, but the U.S. military has incredible logistics capacity to literally move uh, and deliver food and water and sanitation systems unlike anything, uh, 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 any other entity, unlike uh, what even the U.S. civilian agencies can do. And that that's what the population demands that when we can act to save people's lives, that we should do that. Now, it's not always the case. A lot of it's driven by emotional appeals on TV, so it's not entirely rational. But that's certainly a big, big part of okay, why we see such a response. Okay, let me follow up here with Chantel. Response. Uh, Todd mentioned TV there, and I want to follow up on that angle. I, I know you've been watching CNN down there, and I know that you have seen the graphic that I guess one of their hosts had up the other day that said, Saving Haiti. What did you think of that when right. you saw it? Anderson Cooper's hero saving Haiti, and my stomach started to wrench. How come? Um, not, <laughs> not, not necessarily because I don't appreciate the attention that CNN and. Now, sorry, was it wrenching Anderson over Anderson Cooper, Cooper or over the graphic? <laughs> the graphic. It was wrenching over the. Just wanted to clarify. Was, that's all. <laughs> wrenching over the concept of saving Haiti. That in you know that's the way in which um, it becomes paternalistic, mm -hmm. uh, where. The heroes are from abroad, although he does uh, do a good job of also talking about local heroes. I think it's important to acknowledge the work of those who are are working hard to to contribute to the to the rescue and to the uh, to the redevelopment and all of these things. Um, but it, it, I, it just gives me pause, and I and I just ask for caution as as we proceed in terms of the thinking of the language that we use, um, the the images Let me that, get we, gypsy on that we focus mm -hmm. on. Gypsy, mm -hmm. have you seen add... examples of paternalism that have bothered you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's throughout most of our history. You know, the, the fundamental approaches that I, that I referred to earlier on, I, I think must also include this idea of giving Haitians a hand up and not a hand out. You know, yes, we need help, but we, we have resources, we have capabilities, and we can do things in concert with those who will uh, help us through their larger or greater resources. And so uh, that paternalistic approach has to, be, has to be something that we automatically reject, uh, you know, as people who do the giving. And clearly, we're going to reject it as those who are on the receiving end. And so that, that, that is something that we in the diaspora, I think, will have to continue to shine light on, uh, to continue to repeat, such that the same dynamics uh, don't play themselves out again, such that not, not much changes in the relationship of getting aid and, and what happens at the end with what all that aid was supposed to achieve. Janice. Yeah, to be fair now to the, to the NGOs that we give the money to, uh, we just talked earlier about accountability. And we want to know how they're using our money and what results they're getting. So look at the position we're putting them, right? We're saying, lead, don't lead, don't be paternalistic, follow. But oh, by the way, by the same token, we want to know what results you're getting mm -hmm. for all the money that we gave you. In fact, what we're doing in this conversation, we're putting NGOs in an untenable bind. We in the North, who give to Northern NGOs, demand accountability, demand transparency, but by the, in the same breath, say, be very careful, don't leave the conversation. 
I think it's important that we understand what, how, contradic uh, how contradictory uh, our ask to. is of them. Okay, let's do, uh, I want to read one more graphic here. This is from Newsweek, and uh, then we'll come back and chat about this. We've got about six minutes left here. Imagine that you are walking near a shallow ornamental pond when you notice that a small child has fallen in and is apparently in danger of drowning. You look around for the child's caregiver, but there is no one in sight. Without pausing even to pull off the expensive pair of shoes you are wearing, you rush into the water to save the child. You don't have to be a hero to do that. We expect it of you. You'd have to be a monster to put the cost of your shoes ahead of saving the child's life. Or would you? UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund, tells us that nearly 10 million children under age 5 die each year from causes that we could prevent. That's 27,000 children dying every day. They die from diseases that are easy and inexpensive to prevent or treat, or from the lack of safe drinking water, sanitation, and an adequate diet. GiveWell.net, an organization that assesses the cost-effectiveness of aid, suggests that for something like the cost of a pair of expensive shoes, you could save the life of one of these children. Okay, here's the, I guess, the ethical question involved here. Elizabeth, Haiti's been in a very poor condition for a very long time, and you've come on the program numerous times and talked to us about this. Why does it take an earthquake to get people interested in improving people's situations there? Uh, that, that's a very hard question. Um, I, I, I don't know. Uh, because all of the things that you mentioned have been known. The fact that people have, uh, you know, have to, to go prior to the earthquake had so much trouble accessing water, for example, and that the, the potable water given by Kemep and SNEP, which are the, uh, the utility companies in Haiti, is actually not drinkable, mm -hmm. and uh, that you have to put bleach in it to, to, you know, to make it safe. Uh, I don't know why, why people, I guess because it's, it's not of great interest, it's not sexy hmm. and so on, okay, but now me, it is. Okay, let me save some time for everybody else on this. Chantel, mm -hmm. why do you think it takes a huge disaster like this to get people interested? Shock value, um, you know, people just wake up when they see things that really strike to their hearts. Um, and, you know, we have so many things vying for our attention. I think that's why a lot of people have also been saying, don't let Haiti get lost once it's not on uh, you know, Anderson Cooper's feature for the week or on the front of the newspapers. Uh, so I think that, that's all. And, and some people are just simply unaware. And some people are simply unaware. But I think the other uh, problem with that sort of analogy is that um, it, it's, it's too micro in its focus. And we really need to think about the overall systems of our, of our global economy that support the type of poverty and, and injustices that exist in Haiti today. Okay. Encourage it. <laughs> Encourage it. Todd, your view on that? Well, I think, you, you know, to look at your, to go back to your example, of course you, you save the child, but the question after you save them is, you know, where are the parents, well, what, why isn't this kid in school? Uh, and there's a, similar, there's a similar dynamic with aid where you can help in an immediate crisis to raise people up to a certain, a certain level, but you cannot help create a prosperous societies from outside. You can help a process that's moving along, but you just can't do that from the outside. Gypsy, you got a view on that? I totally agree that you, it must not be done. We know it doesn't work. It's never worked, and there's no reason why we ought to, to attempt to make it work again in this rebuilding and reconstruction process in Haiti. And I'm sitting here thinking, you know, Haiti's going to again become an interesting case study uh, in how we learn, uh, how we implement best practices, and how we reject those practices and ideas that we know uh, have, have never worked. So, you know, building institutions, we're building, rebuilding infrastructure, uh, ensuring that we create new systems of care. You know, there's a, there's a growing class of handicaps in, in Haiti right now, you know, as a result of folks having survived uh, the earthquake but having lost uh, limbs. And so we're, we're going to have to see how we, as, as a world community, uh, support uh, creating that system of care, creating and building that infrastructure. And, and again, uh, you know, we'll see whether or not the lessons learned throughout history with other societies with uh, similar circumstances as Haiti, um, whether or not we, ha we haven't figured out what works when we already know what it is, in fact, that does work. Got it. Janice so, that's the, that's world, the, great the, world, the world community has a very short attention span, just like mm -hmm. people do, and we shouldn't be surprised, frankly. Uh, and the reason we get this outburst is because we react emotionally long before we think we react emotionally. And once those pictures fade from television, you referred to that earlier, and they will fade a month from now or two months from now, then you're up against a whole different challenge. You're up against 
the challenge of sustaining government commitments that are responding to their population. They will move on to another issue. And it would be interesting, Steve, if you reconvene this panel a year from now and we talked about how deep, how long-standing, how sustained the commitment to rebuilding Haiti is. What do you think we'd be saying? I think we'd all be disappointed. Now, if you know that today, mm -hmm. why don't we make sure that doesn't happen a year from well, now? Well, because, you know, it's, it's costly and it's not the money. I don't actually believe it's the, it's the money. As much as it is, publics move on in their attention and governments respond to publics. Hmm. And there will be something else that is, that there will be another running headline, not on CNN, but on, <laughs> on TVO a year from now. Got 20 seconds, Elizabeth, do you want it? <laughs> just, just, I think that what the earthquake did, though, that will make it different from, uh, that makes our perception of Haiti different now, is that it, it presented like a global view of, of, of uh, a more holistic, as we say, view of how Haitians live. So it isn't just a water problem or a this problem or that. Mm. It put it all together. And there was a lot of analysis, and, 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 and then the visuals made it absolutely clear in a way that had never been done before. Gotcha. I want to thank everybody for tonight's conversation. Gypsy Metalus and Chantal Verna so. at our studios down there in Miami, Florida. Todd Moss, uh, the senior fellow for the Center for Global Development in Washington, D.C., and here in Toronto, Elizabeth Abbott. Haiti, the Duvaliers and their legacy is her book. And, of course, our friend Janice Stein from the Monk Center for International Studies. Thanks so much, everybody.